2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. It says here, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Talking about the Antichrist there. But notice it says, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. A lot of the reformers had the idea, you know, they, a lot of them were Catholics and then they came out of Catholicism or just tried to reform Catholicism. Major issues there. But a lot of these reformers, the Protestant reformers, back in the 16th century especially, like Luther and, and uh, some of these other guys, um, they were calling the Pope Antichrist. Now they had the right concept there. The mystery of iniquity that sits over there, it's already working. All right. But he, you know, they, they turned it into a thing where it's not actually a man that's going to show up. It's just the seat of the Vatican. No, 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 no. It's very clear that the beast in the future, he's called the man of sin, the son of perdition, here in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, um, verse 3. And ironic, by the way, I gotta say this too. The son of perdition. Um Jesus Christ called Judas Iscariot, you know, that uh, he'll go into perdition and things, and the son of perdition. He gives him the SOP, the SOP, at the, you know, Last Supper. Very interesting tie in there. But this mystery of iniquity, these, this system is already there. It's just waiting for the right guy to come into it. And again, this, you know, I did a video, I got, you know, flagged for copyright violation and things like this, but this, HBO thing about the young pope, I think it's called. And, I mean, they're, they're clearly, it's predictive programming. They're getting people ready for this Antichrist to show up. I do believe he's going to be young. I do believe he'll probably be attractive. It could very well be this Emmanuel Macron guy. I don't know. There's speculation. I mean, the guy's younger than I am. It's kind of like, that's weird. It makes me feel really old, <laughs> you know. The president of France is younger than me. Huh, brother. But, uh, you know. You get a guy like that, you put him in a papal uniform, and you you know he's the new pope and things. And I don't know. I tend to think you know if you say well it could be well, if if you want my honest opinion, I think that the Antichrist is literally it's not like he's going to be someplace and then they're just going to make him pope. I think he hasn't even showed up visibly being seen yet, and I don't think he will until the body of Christ is gone. Um, I, again, I can't be dogmatic. That's just my personal opinion on it. I'm not teaching that as doctrine. It could be Macron. It could be this Kushner or whatever, Kushner or whatever, Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner or something like this. It could be one of those guys. I have no idea. And, you know, you say, well, yeah, but the, they're not popular or whatever. The media can take anybody and turn them into a god overnight. All right? And you'd make one of them guys the, a pope or something like this, uh, and it's funny, too, because this young pope, uh, he was the first pope from America, you know, which Kuchner would be, you know, Jewish pope from America. And there's a lot of other weird things about that young guy, but the point is, the beast is going to be a man. But he's not going to just go and show up and, and everybody goes, oh, what's he? All? You know, he's going to be in the papal system. There are kings that are there before him, in other words. Kings wear crowns. Popes wear crowns. If you don't think that the Pope is a king, you're quite foolish. But let's continue. Revelation, go back to Revelation 17. Revelation chapter 17. We're going to go to verse 12. It says here, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings, one hour with the beast. Yeah, I read that doing this study, and I thought to myself, one hour? <laughs> you know? All this political scheming, and all this maneuvering, and all this, you know, waving, kissing babies, and all this other stuff that they do to get into their positions of power, and you get to enjoy your reign for an hour. Boy, that's worth it, you know? Groomed for these positions and everything else. Pretty pathetic. Go back to the book of Job in the Old Testament. I'll show you a good verse. Job chapter 20. This made me think about this. 
all this power stuff that's going on and and uh you know we gotta elect so and so and we gotta get this person in and they're gonna they're you know lined up to be the next head of the such and such summit meeting or whatever <laughs> stupid job chapter 20 verses 4 through 9 Knowest thou not this of old, since man was placed upon earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, like an hour, and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment, though his excellency mount up to the heavens, and his head reach unto the clouds, yet he shall perish forever like his own dung. <laughs> they which have seen him shall say, Where is he? He shall fly away as a dream, and shall not be found. Yea, he shall be chased away as a vision of the night. The eye also which saw him shall see him no more, neither shall his place any more behold him. Um, give you a, let me ask you a question. 3,000 years ago, who was in charge of Germany? Huh? I have no idea. Yet he shall perish forever like his own dung. Whoever it was, well, I can't tell you who it was. Uh, whoever it is, they're fertilizer now. Isn't that something? I mean, can you tell me, can you name all of the presidents that we've ever had here in America? Or your country? Can you name the, the rulers for the last 200 years? Tell me anything about them? The triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. Well, I'm nothing. I'm just a just a lowly Christian. I'm not a big politician or world leader or anything else. You're something, Christian. You're something else. Revelation 17, going back there. When you realize who you're connected to as a Christian, you're part of the body of Christ. You are a child of the God of the universe when you get saved. You are somebody. You think God's going to care? You think anybody's going to even bat an eyelash when the kings and the queens and the prime ministers and the whatever, presidents and whoever, comes up at the great white throne judgment before they're cast into the lake of fire forever? Do you think anybody's going to care? you think anybody's going to be standing in line there or whatever else and run up, Oh, Angela Merkel, can I get your autograph? You know, Oh, President Trump, oh, it's such an honor to see you here, sir. Oh, well, Trump, I think is... If you think Trump is saved, you are foolish, okay? <laughs> Again, trained at Fordham University. And his two sons, one went to, to Georgetown, I think the other went to Fordham. Jesuits. Just disgust me. Patterns his apartment after occult themes and things like this. This elaborate apartment, you know, after, I forget what the king was, a uh, French king or something like this, that hated Christians and killed Christians. But he's a Christian adultering, fornicating, wicked man, made a lot of his money from casinos and things like this. But, oh, I think he's a Christian because he holds up the Bible. I found it interesting that his, his little trophy wife came out here, Melania or whatever else, and she's admitted that she is a devout Roman Catholic. What a surprise. But let's continue. Verse 13 and 14. It says here, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Let me ask you a question real quick there before we continue to verse 14. How can ten different kings have one mind? Uh, well, they can do it if they're all subservient to Rome, to Roman Catholicism. You see, when you're a Catholic, again, you have to understand this. i got to go into this thing. Some of you might not have heard me talk about this before. There are two swords that the Vatican believes that they control. All right. They believe that they control the spiritual and the temporal. Right? Those are the two swords of Roman Catholicism. The spiritual is they control the church. All religions are to be subjected to Roman Catholicism. And if you say, I don't bow to Rome, then they will call you a heretic and read church history. Yeah, and you'll find out what they did to heretics. Okay? The second sword, the temporal, means the things that are here on the earth. All physical governments, all kingdoms are subservient to Rome. And if they don't uh, submit themselves to the Vatican, 
there will be there will be a, a regime change or a war or a military coup or something like that. You step out of line, whack, down you go. All right. So anytime you have a Roman Catholic, those Roman Catholics, they can be a German, but if they're Roman Catholic, their loyalty is first to the Vatican. American loyalty first to the Vatican. British, uh, French, Spanish, whatever. Loyalty first to the Roman Catholic Church. You are a citizen of Rome first and then whatever your country is. So that's how you can have these have one mind. Ten kings in the future, they'll have one mind. And it's a Catholic mind. Verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. A very, very, very interesting thing there. Let's go to Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. One of my favorite passages of Scripture. It says here, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Remember that, that's going to be important, these armies in heaven. Verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. What we just read over in Revelation 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, the ten kings, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark, uh, yeah, them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the, the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. That's the end of these ten kings and the beast, too, I might add, and the false prophet. Greatest military power that's ever been formed, 200 million man army. All the you know United Nations, we're all together, we're bringing a brave new world and all this other stuff that they're trying to do. And, uh, you know, I think, too, you know, i got to say this because we were talking about this, my wife and I, this whole artificial intelligence, transhumanism stuff. If Judas Iscariot was a devil walking around in a body of flesh, I believe, personally, that a lot of these robots and transhumanist artificial intelligence, I believe that they are literally creating mechanical bodies for devils. So it's endued with this special knowledge, and it can think for itself, and it... Yeah, devils. Interesting. But let's look at this key thing here in Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. You see three things. Called, chosen, and faithful. Ironically, you have in Romans chapter 12, there is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Three parts to it. Called, chosen, faithful. Let's see about each one. Acts chapter 11. Sometimes my, my uh, brain works quicker than my mouth, I think, or something. I'm like, uh, getting ahead of myself here. I was going to say something. I had to catch myself. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called... Christians first in Antioch. I have a question for you, Christian. 
Do people call you a Christian? Can they tell? Friends, neighbors, co-workers, family? Do they say, oh, he's one of those Christians? Or do you blend in with the world? Notice they didn't call themselves, the disciples didn't call themselves Christians. It says there in the text, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The people, lost people called them Christians. Oh, you know, there's another place that says that they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. Do people associate you with Jesus Christ? As one of those Christians. If you're saved, you ought to be called a Christian by the lost world. Pretty important. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter one verses one through three. It says here Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Call upon the name of Jesus Christ. That's for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Romans 10 isn't for you. <laughs> it's so simple. I mean, you know, you come, you say, I need to be saved. God, please say, oh, no, don't do that. Shh, don't, don't call upon him. Shh, don't, you know, that's work salvation. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> crazy, crazy bunch of stupid nonsense. Call upon him. You're not, you're not saved. Call upon the Lord. Okay. Believe what he did for, for you on the cross and call upon him. Get saved. <laughs> Verse 3, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So, again, you're called. When he saves you, he says, okay, you're called to be saints. He, uh, when he calls you, he says, okay, I'm going to do some things with your life now. Called to be saints. He's going to change your life. It's positive, you know. It's a good thing. You come to the Lord as a sinner and you and he says, Oh, sure, yeah, you're in. You say, well, uh, can I have some help with this life that I'm living? Oh, well, I don't know. I guess I could. <laughs> Again, these false gospels. I mean, when you, I mean, you get into all these little debates of Scripture, and you step back occasionally. I'm going to be redoing one of my old sermons I did many years ago called Milk, Milk Versus Meat. Uh, I don't think a lot of people get that study. It's, a, it's an extremely important one. And in that study I talked about the only way that you can eat spiritual meat in Scripture, very hard doctrine, that's what is meat in Scripture, is if you wash it down with milk, the milk of the Word, that you get as a newborn baby Christian or young you know, children and things like this, they can look at the Bible, they go, I understand Jesus died for my sins and I should pray to him and ask him to see me. You know, they just read it. Well, yeah, it's for me, you know. They look and they say, you know, in the future, do you think God's going to put us through his judgment and wrath or do you think he's going to catch us away before his wrath falls on the earth? Well, he'd take us out of here, wouldn't he? He loves me, doesn't he? Well, sure, he'd take me out. It's milk. Easy. But, you know, I'm going to redo that study because I need to. You know, the thing of milk versus meat. Washing meat down with milk. You can't ever have milk or meat without milk. You're going to choke. But I'll, I'll get to doing that. But Jude chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Check this out. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. What do we just read over in Coloss or 1 Corinthians chapter 1? We're called to be saints. Verse 15, To execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Hmm. The people that are drunk, the people don't want to hear the gospel, those ungodly people, 
they speak against Jesus Christ. And guess what, Christian? When you get saved, you're called. You made it to the first step as a Christian. You're called. And if you follow through with your life as a Christian, you're going to be coming back down to judge these wicked people. It kind of gives a new thought to witnessing to the lost world and to talking to people about the Bible and, and, and it just making videos and doing what you can. Again, you know, I've, I'm having a conversation with a sister and things and I've been through this with other people. They say, you know, I'm just not the best one-on-one -on -one just walking up to people. Hello, how are you doing today? And striking up a conversation and getting into salvation. Some people are not called into that. That's the job of an evangelist. Some people are very evangelistic and they can, they can do great. There are others that are teachers and preachers and, and other gifts and things like that. You don't have to feel bad because you're not some expert evangelist. But when you do have an opportunity, don't think to yourself, hey, I'm going to fail at this. Oh, what a, oh, I probably said something wrong. You can't fail all right, when you're, when you're serving the Lord like that. I mean, there's so many subjects. I, I could be going off on rabbit trails. I'm trying to keep this. <laughs> but you see, we're called to be saints. Saints come back with Jesus Christ. Like we're reading in Revelation 17. Now go to chosen. We're going to talk about chosen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So you get called when you're saved. He calls you to be a saint. We just read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But now let's look at... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning, beginning in verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, called, how that not many uh, wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So God will save anybody. He'll save a sinner. doesn't matter what your past is or what you've done or whatever else. God will save you. All right? So you're called. But the chosen thing is a different story. God won't just choose anybody and say, oh, yeah, you're, you know, you got some pride issues there and you got some other th sins that you're dealing with as a new Christian. Um, come on, you're just going to use you for ministry. No, he... Uh, it says there, He has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen. All right? And, you know, the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. God will choose you if you're in a weak situation. So, you're called as a Christian, but then it kind of goes down to another group, or, or up if you want to say that, where it's called, and then it says, okay, there's even less that are chosen, and of those that are chosen for doing something for the Lord, you go on to the next one, which is faithful. We'll be going there in just a minute, but I'm going to show you another tie into the thing of chosen. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Very interesting little tie in here to the thing of chosen. And remember what we're talking about, Revelation chapter 17, verse uh, 14, where it talks about, you know, King of kings, Lord of lords, Jesus Christ comes back, and those that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Look at this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, see about faithful here in a couple minutes, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You're going to have to learn about spiritual warfare. You're going to have to learn to, to fight for Jesus Christ if he chooses you to be a soldier. He'll call you. You get saved. He'll say, okay, you got to start sanctifying that life. You're a saint now. You know, I've heard so many people profess to be Christians. They say, well, I, I'm no saint. And I'm thinking, that's not something that you want to say. If you're saved, you're a saint. And it's your job, when the Holy Spirit convicts you, he'll do that part. 
He'll convict you of certain sins, but it's your job to give those sins up. It's called sanctification. All right? But while you're doing that, you're called to be a saint. The next part is chosen. The Lord will say, okay, I'm going to pick you for whatever ministry. I've given you certain spiritual gifts. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's different gifts. I'm going to give you those gifts. And now I want you to use them for this ministry that I've put you into. So what comes next? Faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter four, verses one through two. It says here, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Talked about that, the mysteries. You can watch my study on the different mysteries. Verse two. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful, not successful, not popular, not whatever faithful you know it's really sad to me and i've talked about this before but it's really really sad to me that a lot of the brethren that i once thought were decent whatever else they've proved themselves to not be faithful at one point in time i could say yeah they were called and i could see there was that choosing of god that he put them in and he was doing things through that you know person a man or woman or whatever else i'd see both, you know, doing things for the Lord on YouTube or in, in ministries and things. But all of a sudden they start to go off and they go back to the world. They're not faithful. Our Bible here says, Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, the ones that come back with Jesus Christ are called, chosen, and faithful. Hmm. Interesting. It says, I think it's 2 Th uh, Timothy chapter 2, about if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Do you know soldiers suffer? They absolutely do. They suffer a lot sometimes. You have to suffer a little bit, Christian. Titus chapter 1. You say, well, this is, you know, just for people I guess that are in ministry or something well see about this Titus chapter 1 verses 6 through 9 if any be blameless the husband of one wife having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God not self-willed not soon angry not given to wine no striker not given to filthy lucre but a lover of hospitality a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to gain, er, and to convince, excuse me, the gainsayers. Faithful. Even his children are supposed to be faithful. I'll show you another verse that's interesting here. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 11. Speaking of faithful here. 1 Timothy 3.11 says, Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Interesting. What do we read at the very beginning of this study? Those that are in love with the Vatican system, they are drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Or with the, the wine of her fornication, excuse me. Thinking of the wrath of God coming upon them. Um, they're drunk. This verse here says, Even so must their wives not or be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Hmm. Sobriety. And by the way, that's uh, sobriety there is for both ministry, you know, wives that are in ministry and also just the average Christian woman. You say, well, you know, but okay, I'm, I'm not a preacher or I'm not a this or whatever. Well, you know, those qualifications that are there for a, a man that's a bishop, you have them here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, they're there too. Those qualifications, yes, that's there for a bishop, but I believe it's there for every Christian. I believe that we should all aspire to those things. I believe that we are to set our standards high is what we're supposed to do. Hmm. 
So those that are going to come back with Jesus Christ, you can go back to Revelation 17. I mean, the Bible says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. Not he, he won't deny your salvation or anything. You're in Christ. He cannot deny Himself, the passage says. Uh, but the point is, He's going to deny you millennial reign. And I think maybe there will be Christians, maybe they'll stay up in heaven. Uh, there's a guy, uh, Joey Faust, and he says that carnal Christians will go to hell for the thousand-year millennial kingdom. I think that's stupid. Absolutely stupid. You know, part of the body of Christ is in hell for the thousand years and parts on the earth are... I don't believe that way. Uh, you know, I don't know what will happen. You know, whether Christians that are that mess around and are carnal or whatever will stay up in heaven for the millennial kingdom, or if they'll come down to the earth and like clean toilets or something for a thousand years, or or horse stalls or something. I have no idea. <clears throat> but it's very plain that those who come back with Jesus Christ in Revelation 17 verse 14, they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. That's your duty, Christian. I mean, again, I just got to kick this other thing while I'm going through this here. And that is a lot of Christians have this funny notion that, that uh, when they get saved, it's just, hey, buddy, with God, you know, and hey, old buddy, slap him on the back. That's not the relationship that we have with God. The Bible says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God for the lost world. We're supposed to understand that. And we're supposed to serve God reverently, with reverence and godly fear. God is not your buddy-buddy. He's the King of glory. Controls the universe. By Him all things consist. You have to remember that stuff. You have responsibilities in this life to remain faithful to the things of the Lord. Don't quit. Okay, let's go through the last couple of verses here. Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. It's not America. Not America. But you look at the Vatican, they got their hands in all the different countries out there. Missionaries and schools and things like this. They sure certainly do. Verse 16, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. I find it interesting that towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, people start turning on each other. This new world order, this one world government where we can all come together in love and diversity, it just goes when implodes. The whole thing just falls apart. And all of a sudden, all these people that are, you know, coming together and they're singing and they're hugging each other, you know. I see these, uh, you know, people out there and they're like holding up these signs, you know, and they're chanting, No hate, no fear, Muslim refugees are welcome here, you know. And then you see like a couple months later and they're, they're you know, they'll interview some of these same people and they're going, you know, we had some Muslim refugees, some Syrian refugees in our neighborhood, you know, and they like attacked our children and they're like burning things and and doing all this stuff, and I wish they'd go home. <laughs> you know, integration, boy. Hey, you know. <laughs> Crazy. But you see, it's eventually just going to this whole new world order system. Towards the end of the thing, it's just going to be like, not going to work. Verse 17. Very, very key scripture here again. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. That's a wonderful promise, brethren. God controls even the most powerful people. He controls it all. He's moving things toward an end that He has out there. This book here, I've said it before in other studies and I'm going to say it again. This book here, your King James Bible, is pre-recorded history. We have been given a more sure word of prophecy. You can count on this book. You can read this and go, I uh, wonder if this is going to happen. Yeah, it's, it's going to happen. Absolutely. The Vatican, with all of its things that it got away with, 
seemingly got away with over the centuries. All the millions upon millions upon millions of people that just had horrible things done to them. It's all going to come back. And their own political scheming is eventually going to blow up in their own faces. And those faithful Roman Catholics are going to turn on their own system because God put it in their heart to do it. Why? Because he wrote a book telling us what was going to happen and nothing is going to stand in the way of this book coming to pass. You know, for my enemies out there that really hate me, uh, you can put a bullet in my head. You can kill me, you can kill my wife, you can kill my son, whatever else. The book's still going to happen. You can come, you can take every Bible out of this library here, out of my collection. You can take this Bible out of my dead hands. That's the only way you're going to get it. You can take my Bible from me. You can burn all the Bibles, every King James Bible you can find. It's still going to come to pass. And you'll never burn them all. Little Jesuit jerks, they understand that. They know that. They hate this book. Pre-recorded history, brethren. It's going to come to pass. Let's finish up with the last verse. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. The Vatican. Rome. That's the city. They're the ones that control things. And all these liars, they come out and they say, well, it's America. It's America. So that when America falls as a country, when the economy finally collapses, they can say, see, Babylon has fallen. Hey, it's all over. The Catholic Church is still in power. Well, yeah, but they're not Babylon. Babylon was America. They're liars. They're deceivers. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, if there's anyone out there that's not saved yet, that you would just go out there and just shake them to pieces. Lord, do whatever you have to do to put your fear upon them. Uh, help them know the terror of the Lord. What's coming to this earth is going to be so horrible, so fearful, Lord. I just pray that they would wake up out of their slumber and get saved. And for those that are saved, Lord, that have listened to this whole study, I pray that they would be challenged and have the confidence that your word inspires and uh, know that these things that are written, um, they are going to come to pass. We have a more sure word of prophecy. We don't have to worry about the future and think, I wonder, I wonder if this happens or that. It's all under your, under your control, Lord. And I pray that you would give each of us chances to stand up for you and for your word. And uh, just help us, Lord, in this very wicked time, not to become drunk with the wine that is uh, created by the Vatican with all the political scheming and all the Hollywood and all the covetousness that we're subjected to, Lord, that we would not um, fall for that stuff. I just really do pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I just want people to understand something. There's a concept in both the secular world and in the Bible, secular world takes it from the Bible. They just don't give the Lord credit for such things. But that uh, concept is Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. When things start to get out of control, and you start to see all this high-tech world government stuff and all these other bad things coming in, you know what you do? Ask for the old paths. How did people live in the past? Before the grocery stores. Before cell phones. Before cars. Before all of this stuff. Well, you just have to have your job because you got bills to pay. And you have to do this and you have to do that because it's so important. Come out of the mind control. I'm not telling you to live out in some out in the woods and you know in a in a tent or something. I'm not saying to do that. I'm not telling you that, that that's what you should do or something. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is don't let those things control you. Don't don't let those things take you away from serving the Lord. They make you weak. You know, there have been many times when I've thought I have a job to do or something like that, and you know, I go out and I'm like, oh, I gotta, 
dig out this one area here or something, and I'm like, oh boy, I'm gonna have to rent some kind of backhoe or some kind of thing. And the thought occurs to me, you got a shovel, you got a pickaxe. I can't dig all that. What did people do in the past? And you know what? In my stubbornness sometimes, I've gone against that good sense, the Jeremiah 616 sense, we'll call it that. I've gone against that thing and I've said, ah, I don't have time to do it the other way. I've gotten machines different times. I've rented machines, bought machines, things like this to do a job, some kind of construction job, and the thing ends up breaking down or whatever, whatever, and I, I get to the end of that thing, I look back and I think, you know what? It would have been quicker for me to do it with a shovel. Just incredible. God can take care of you, brethren. And I've seen that thing. I've seen how the Lord can provide for people. And uh, I don't know how much longer we have to go. I mean, I just, I keep looking at this world going, how can it go another week? <laughs> just like, it's really getting wild. Uh, but we could still be here for a few years. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the only way that you're going to make it, the only way that you're going to remain faithful is stay in this book, this King James Bible. Don't you dare put this thing down. The faithful word that's been committed to you, you keep that. It's your most precious possession is right here. I see all the time floods and fires and things, people's homes being destroyed, and I think, and they're like, oh, we lost everything. And I thought, well, if that ever comes here, if I ever have to go through that, I'm not losing everything because I'm going to take this with me. This is more important than money. This is more important than anything that you have. It's the book. King James Video Ministries is this ministry. I've been in this for 10 years now, and I still say the same thing. It's the Bible. It's all about this King James Bible. It's the most important possession that you have. So that is going to be it. I just want to thank everybody for your prayers. Thank you for watching. And I guess we'll see you in the next study.